Welcome to today's episode of Time Well Spent. I'm pleased to have Mark Ahiogye join us for today's discussion. Mark is the coordinator and client support at the Black Youth Helpline. His role includes working directly with school districts across Canada. Thank you so much for your time today, Mark, as we explore the concept of anti-Black racism and the steps that we can all take to move forward in standing up against it and the harm it causes. Yeah, thank you very much for having me and the Black Youth Helpline here today, Daryl. Uh, these are very important conversations and myself and the Black Youth Helpline are very honored to be a part of these conversations. <clears throat> so the Black Youth Helpline was founded in 1992 by youth volunteers who saw a need in their community and decided to address it. And it's because of this approach that we have become a thriving national organization which supports all Canadians from coast to coast. Our vision is the primary prevention of social psychological breakdown in communities through a focus on education, health, and community development. Through understanding and listening to the voices of the individuals who call the Black Youth Helpline, we developed three key pillars, education, mental health, and community development. We want our youth to stay in school and work towards a zero dismissal measure within the education system. We believe health is key, a key foundation for success and believe sharing and caring about others within the community impacts lives and is the greatest gift of humanity to humanity and society. We support the entire family structure from the youths all the way to the grandparents and as well organizational structures from individuals from schools all the way to nationwide corporations. Overall, the Black Youth Helpline is more than a helpline. We serve all youths and act as a point of contact for calls to our professional services from youths families, school districts, and a variety of youth serving stakeholders. We work to provide culturally sensitive support to those who access our services. So really anyone can call us. You can email us. You can visit our website, um, theblackyouth.ca. You can submit a request or even be a volunteer. We've tried to make ourselves as accessible as possible. So there's a multitude of, of, of ways you can contact and use the services that we provide at the Black Youth Helpline. One key thing is to understand that everyone is on a different level of the spectrum when it comes to this topic, right? So it is important to self-reflect and understand where you might be. So I've outlined a few, few steps on effectively how to better situate yourself. So the first step is to become aware. And this is likely the most dif difficult step, right? This truly comes from self-reflection and putting yourself in other people's shoes right and gain a sense of being able to identify with the real life impact and imp implications of anti-black racism whether it's within your country community or household number two being open to these conversations right you don't have to understand it perfectly but you need to purposely put yourself in spaces or create spaces for these conversations to be had it's a very, it's very much an active pro process. Number three, educate yourself on the topic. Once again, you don't have to have a PhD in anti-black racism, right? It's simply a matter of speaking to the individuals within your community who experience these things, or bringing individuals with the appropriate expertise to lead such conversations, such as the Black Youth Helpline, right? Number four, ask questions. It's important to be curious and actively try to fill in areas of uncertainty and blind spots. So 
ask questions. Number five, action, which is, I would say, the most important step, right? Um, this might be different for everyone based on your, what you have access to or the level of influence you might have. So everybody can um, create action in a multitude of ways. For example, in the school system, it might be to identify the demographics of your students and, teach it, and teaching body and ask critical questions about does our student, our student body or teaching body, does, do they reflect the community around us, right? And then examining, are there ways we can increase the diversity of the teaching body? Are there discrepancies between, and then furthermore, asking further questions, right? Are there discrepancies between graduation rates uh, between different groups? What measures can we put in place to support this group? And understanding it, if these measures are culturally sensitive and aware of other people's differences, right? For example, um, say in, in a school environment, um, there are low income students who are unable to, to afford lunch. Um, you can understand that this might affect their academic abilities because they'll be weak or tired during the, the long school period having not eaten lunch, right? So understanding that aspect and then trying to determine if there are ways to find out um, what these students need and find measures to support them, right? And this will help to ensure that everyone has the same level playing field. It's important and one has to be willing to understand one's own limitation on the topic and be comfortable to bring in experts who better understand the situation and can support the navigation of such situations, spaces, or wherever it might be. I would like to actually share a personal story about a boy named Samson. So in this situation, Samson is his alias name and not his real name. But I'm going to share two outcomes, right? So the first outcome was the result due to Black Youth Health Plan support and intervention. And the second outcome is the typical outcome for families such as Samson's when they have no support. Okay. So <clears throat> Samson is an 11 year old boy is raised by a single mother, right? So one day Samson needed a drink of water after playing outside for class. And during which time the end of the, bell, of the day bell rang. He attempted to enter the school and the vice principal told him he could not. He explained he just needed a drink of water. When the vice principal turned her glance away Samson rushed to the cooler, just inside the doors, drank water, and immediately left the school. The vice principal reported to the, to the principal who phoned um, his, parent, his, his mom and explained that Samson was being suspended for three days for disrespecting the vice principal. This was one of repeated suspensions. So, Samson's mom contacted the school but they do not listen. They don't believe what she's saying or they just, her approach and her ability to communi effectively communicate what she wants to communicate is not received well. So she's very stressed, right? And now she has to take time off work to be with her son. And this means essentially what it means. She can't work, she can't make money. She's a single parent, single family income, right? So now, the entire family is losing um, potential income, right? She calls Black Youth Helpline team for support and explains the situation that her son just needed a drink of water because his life was in danger. Her son is diabetic, right? With the support of the Black Youth Helpline, Samson's mother and the Black Youth Helpline collectively ask that the case be reopened and his file be reviewed. 
The school finds that it had a record of Samson's diabetic condition. Therefore, now they're able to better understand Samson's behavior as not being um, a disturbance, but being an action he had to take at that moment. As such, the school apologizes, creates accommodations for Samson, and he's able to earn his education without further hiccups. Right? So now I want to explain the second outcome, which is the typical likely outcome that happens when individuals don't have support. So without Black Youth Helpline support, <laughs> the likely life course for this child would have been repeated suspensions leading to expulsion. Therefore, as he grows up with no high, high school or higher education degree, he can't get a job. So because he can't get a job and can't make money, he makes the wrong decision by getting involved with the wrong individuals. Okay? So then he gets arrested and gets thrown and gets sent to jail. And all this does really is to strengthen the school to prison pipeline. The statistics would say Samson was a dropout, but no, no, no. Samson would have been pushed out of the school system. Basically without his own choice or reasoning in, in, in the manner. And his parents would not be able to help him or whatnot. And this would have been his final way, way he would have ended up with. But Black Youth Helpline should not be necessary because the individuals within the school system should act and account for these blind spots and not allow our youth to fall through the cracks. I believe it is important not to prejudge an, an individual, rather observe the circumstances and situation before the behavior and not the other way around. Work to validate their concerns and try to look at the bigger long-term impact one's actions can have. As teachers and educators, you not only impact a child's now, you are also actively helping to carve and shape the child's destination. So truly consider that and look at the bigger picture before you make a decision. Mark, I'm fully appreciative of the time and the insight, insights that you have shared with us today. Thank you for also for your work with the Black Youth Helpline in supporting families and in supporting schools to find success for all students. This was indeed time well spent. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daryl.